start on a broad question, if I might, this morning. Uh, at the sort of beginning of your conference call, you said, uh, as often CEOs will do, but you said, we've just begun to harness the true power and potential of our platform. Uh, big words, but what do they actually mean? Well, the travel uh, market is just absolutely massive. One point seven trillion dollar uh, part of the economy. It's one of the largest pieces of global GDP. About one in ten jobs in the world uh, are in travel and tourism. Uh, we're one of the largest travel companies in the world, and this year, after growing about thirteen uh, percent in top line basis, we reached just about a hundred billion dollars of bookings. So, if you think about the opportunity ahead of us, it is absolutely massive. Uh, we continue to grow at rates of two to three times as fast as the overall industry on a pretty big base. We've got a good position in the U.S. and Canada. We've got a good position in leisure travel. But in terms of corporate travel, in terms of some of the more nascent uh, products to go online, like cruise, like luxury, like activities, as well as the international opportunity, uh, we just got such a long runway of growth ahead of us. All right. So what should investors be looking for as signs that you are actually succeeding in harnessing that power? Uh, yeah. and potential of the platform. Well, I think investors should be looking for more of the same of what we delivered in 2018. At the beginning of the year, we said we've got three priorities, being locally relevant on a global basis, being customer-centric, and speed up the pace of innovation and execution uh, across our company. Uh, that showed up in the financial results. Again, gross bookings were up 13%, uh, revenue up 12%, adjusted EBITDA up 15%, earnings per share up 35%. And we did that all at the same time as delivering uh, just over a billion dollars back to shareholders in terms of buybacks and our dividends. Uh, we think this type of growth, uh, if we execute well, is something that we can deliver for a very long time. And if we do really well, maybe we can even do a little bit better. One area potentially of concern was the, uh, the home away results. I mean, still 20% growth, 15% bookings growth is good, but it's a lot slower than it's been over the past year. Yeah. So what's causing the slower growth there and how does it look for the rest of the year? Yeah. Well, I, I, again, HomeAway in 2018 uh, grew top line around 30 percent, bottom line around 43 percent, uh, and up to just shy of $12 uh, billion in bookings. Uh, they're in a huge space. Alternative accommodations, I think, as, as you all know, uh, a, a space that's probably worth north of $100, $120 billion and growing very quickly. Uh, HomeAway has been very focused on the domestic market, very focused on its traditional resort, uh, beach, ski destination type offering and over the course of 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, they're going to start pushing more into the international opportunity, uh, which was a bit of a drag for them in the fourth quarter. They're going to start pushing more into the urban opportunity, which is not a place where they've been uh, particularly focused. And then, of course, we're putting all of the HomeAway VRBO inventory on our flagship brands of Expedia, Hotels.com, uh, and increasingly over the course of the next number of years will be made available to our corporate travelers as well. So uh, a little bit of a slowdown over the course of this year, but it's really just ahead of the next leg of what we think could be pretty incredible growth. Hey, Mark, any trends that you're noticing in air travel? Uh, there's been some reports that suggest, at least domestically, load factors are getting a little bit more loose. Uh, I'm wondering if that is something you're confirming either on the business or the uh, consumer side. Yeah, so we've seen, and, and, and 2018 was a pretty strong year for travel uh, globally. I mean, passenger volume uh, continues to grow, uh, occupancy rates near all-time high, average daily rates uh, continue. Uh, but of course, as we started out the year, there were some spots of, of choppiness. You saw the big storms, uh, the polar vortex, that can have an impact on the metrics that you look at. Uh, in the UK, uh, concerns around Brexit, we think anyways, has impacted uh, consumers' uh, decisions around whether to book now or wait, whether to go abroad or whether to stay at home. We saw UK air ticket volume uh, slow down pretty significantly uh, here in, in January. Also some slowdown in terms of uh, uh, continental Europeans traveling into the UK. So something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I, I just personally had to go to London this week. I, I would be I, The plane was maybe a third full. I just thought that was really interesting, and maybe it is UK related. I don't know. Yeah. Are you, are you bracing for any slowdown in the US this year, Mark, economically? 
Yeah, well, I wish I had a crystal ball. I, you know, I think that, again, we ended 2018 with, uh, you know, a, a, on a very strong footing, both in the overall economy and, and, and travel. Uh, but I think as, as on your prior segment mentioned, you've got slowdown in China. Uh, Europe is a real question. And uh, the U.S. is not isolated to this. I think that uh, a slowdown is very possible. Uh, we're fortunate, though, the travel industry is incredibly resilient, and our business specifically is uh, very resilient. So are we being prudent? Uh, absolutely. I think any leader of any uh, global corporation right now should be prudent in terms of making sure we're not going out on a limb with any massive investments. Uh, but we think that uh, 2019, at least from where we sit right now, uh, will be a fine year, uh, but we're braced for anything. Uh, Mark, why is your cloud spending going up so much? I think from 141 million last year to around 250 million dollars uh, on the cloud this year. Well, cloud is the future. Uh, let's let's put it that way. Historically, we have run our own data centers, and we would have hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in equipment that needed to be replaced every three to five years. Uh, and now we're essentially migrating the bulk of that infrastructure into the cloud environment. Uh, it allows us to operate much more resilient infrastructure. It allows us to expand our compute capacity, uh, essentially, you know, with a snap of a finger, so that we can do massive big data calculations run, uh, neural network models, uh, helps us be much more sophisticated in terms of the way that we are delivering personalized experiences, the way we're delivering uh, you know, our marketing messages on a much more tailored basis. And so we're aggressively moving our infrastructure into the cloud environment, and that's showing up in the financial results, but from a free cash flow basis, again, because we're not spending the CapEx on these big data centers, uh, it's been accretive for us, and we think it's the right thing to do on a cash basis. Right, it's a trend we follow closely here. Just curious, uh, are you using one of the vendors out there, AWS or Azure, or are you sort of spreading it around? Yeah, so our primary partner right now is, is AWS. Uh, they've been an absolutely phenomenal partner. Uh, we do have other uh, applications that are running uh, with other providers, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but our primary partner is AWS, and of course, they're just down the road from us, so it's a very easy conversation.